Hello and welcome to Melton Vineyard's online service. Our vision as a church can be summed up in three words. Bless, serve, pray. We want to bless others with the unconditional love of Jesus that we have experienced. We'll serve each other and the wider community and we will pray so that we can do all this in the power of God's Spirit. Our vision for these online services is that they're a space where you can explore faith and discover what kind of church we are at your own pace and in your own way. Each week we share a worship song and a short talk which we hope you'll find encouraging and helpful. If you believe that Melton Vineyard might be a church you could call home and you live in or near the Melton area, we would love to welcome you to one of our on-site services, which are every Sunday morning at 10.30am at John Fernley College. Let's pray. Father God, please meet with us through your Holy Spirit as we turn our hearts and our thoughts towards you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, we love.
So, what sort of community do you want to be part of? Have you got in mind what sort of relationships with the people around you, what you want them to look like? Two weeks ago, we heard George speak about the amazing events of Pentecost and the surprising effects of receiving the Holy Spirit on the early church community. One of the hallmarks of that time was the development of a beautiful countercultural community of believers who, according to the book of Acts, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved. Doesn't that sound like the kind of community that we would all want to be part of? But George alluded to the fact that that kind of community was only possible because of the believers being filled with the Spirit. Because, let's be honest, if we try and do this sort of thing in our own strength, then it rarely works out well, does it? Human experiments in creating communities of mutual support and care often fail because of our human tendency towards selfishness and the need for control which results in some members of the community being oppressed or neglected and other people becoming the oppressors. One very obvious example is the communist movement, which arose as an alternative to a very divided society with rich and powerful upper classes ruling over the impoverished workers. Its philosophy was for each person to give what they could to the society and receive what they needed, holding possessions in common so no one had more than they needed but no one went hungry. But sadly, that philosophy was quickly corrupted by human greed, violence and control, resulting in an authoritarian and oppressive regime that led to great harm for many people. As Christians, we are called to be a very different kind of community, one marked by the God we serve, who's a very different kind of God to any that we might have been able to come up with ourselves a God who is love. The Apostle, Pon, jo, blah, the Apostle John puts it this way, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. But do you know what? The church hasn't always been that kind of beacon of light that it should have been either, has it? What we want is to create beautiful communities of love. And isn't that what the world really desperately needs? So what might that community look like? And how can we partner with, with the Holy Spirit to make our relationships reveal and reflect that generous and loving God that we serve? 
Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you are love. Thank you that you first loved us and that out of that, we are able to love each other. We want to reflect your love in our relationships and in our community and we just ask for you to help us to do that through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. So, this morning we're just continuing in our mini-series on generous discipleship, and we're looking today at relationships and how we can take what we've already learnt of the generous God and practice of generous spirituality that Neil's already spoken about and apply that in our relationships as we seek to become what James Bryan Smith calls in his book a good and beautiful community. I'm going to focus on three areas, unity, forgiveness and encouragement, which I believe are hallmarks of the kind of community that we are called to build in partnership with God and the Holy Spirit. There are lots of other parts to building a community that's good and beautiful. Um, Of course, we will get to those in some of the upcoming talks in future weeks. But I'm just focusing in today on ones that really are about our relationships with each other. I've chosen a passage from Colossians, which you may know. Um, You can find it in your own Bible, or you can read along with me on the screen. Colossians chapter 3, verses 11 to 17. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So in this letter uh, to the early church in Colossae, the Apostle Paul is writing to remind them and reinforce the teaching that he's already given them, and particularly how they can apply that and apply the gospel to how they live. And he begins by reminding them that the differences between them, which used to matter so much, have all been superseded by their identity in Christ All those old hierarchies of society that separated them and defined the relationships between them no longer apply. Whether slave or free, rich or poor, all are equal and all are welcome. There are no first-class or second-class Christians. So ethnic and religious differences have been superseded and no longer define your position in the community as they did before. So in the context of this letter... We're talking about the Greeks, who were the cultured, educated people who looked down on everyone else as being barbarians. That's literally what they called them, because the, anyone who didn't speak Greek, it sounded like bar, 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 barbarians. So that's what they called them. And the Scythians were the worst of the lot. They were like the ultra barbarians, more barbarian than the barbarians in the, in the eyes of the Greeks. So that's why Paul's used that example. And for the Jews, They were used to seeing every other race as being unclean, so they couldn't kind of associate with them, and they should be avoided. But suddenly, those old barriers between peoples from such different backgrounds, who might ordinarily have been enemies and looked down on each other, were now broken down. As Christians, what mattered was their identity in Christ 
which define their relationships. They were actually called to be a family, to sit at the same table and worship alongside each other. I mean, that was pretty revolutionary then, and I guess it is now. So in our relationships with each other and in the community that we are trying to build, we're saying your background does not determine your position. Your ethnicity does not determine how you are treated. Your gender does not affect your welcome here. Not to say that those differences between us don't exist, but that in our community, we're called to unity and equality regardless of those differences. The theologian N.T. Wright says, differences of background, nationality, colour, language, social standing and so forth must be regarded as irrelevant to the question of love, honour and respect that are to be shown to individuals and groups. We are called to love each other. We're called to unity in our diversity. As James Brian Smith says, tolerance is not our primary aim, nor is equality. Our highest aim is love. So we're going above and beyond what the rest of society sees as being okay, tolerance. <laughs> we're called to love. Um, a beautiful example of this was the Pentecostal movement in the USA in the early 20th century, which saw blacks, whites, Latinos, men and women, old and young, worshipping alongside each other, finding their unity in the spirit which was poured out on all of them. That's a picture of the Azusa Street mission. But the inevitable consequence of creating that kind of diverse family is that we will face disagreements, won't we? In a church where we're called to be in relationship with people from different social circles, with different levels of education, from other countries, with different political backgrounds, who've been used to doing church in different ways, we're going to come across things that we don't agree on. The difference in a community of love is that we aren't willing to let that break down our relationships and result in division. So how do we approach disagreements? A helpful phrase, uh, which has sometimes been misattributed to Augustine, but probably came about a bit later than that, but particularly resonated with John Wesley in the Methodist movement, says, in essentials, unity. In doubtful matters, liberty. In all things, charity. In other words... Let's be reminded that we're unified by our one faith in God. That's the thing that really matters. There are other things that we're free to hold different opinions about, aren't there? Those non-essentials. And over all of that, keeping in mind our mutual love for each other and giving each other the benefit of the doubt. During the COVID pandemic, if you remember, it wasn't that long ago, when vaccines were being developed, and there was such a lot of public discussion and disagreement, wasn't there, about how Christians should respond. And Neil asked me to write an article for our church blog about it. And inevitably, it brought out a huge range of responses. And there were people in our church community who really disagreed with where I was coming from. Some people left our church because of that disagreement. But what really struck me and really humbled me was the people who stayed and how our relationships have been able to continue with that mutual respect and love despite completely disagreeing about that matter. That's what a community of love looks like. So are there people in this church that you disagree with? Are there people here that you would not normally mix with? Are there people here that you don't yet know or don't have a relationship with because they just seem different to you? I'm pretty sure the answer is yes to at least one of those questions. So what can we do? Well, here's a, a helpful mnemonic which summarizes an approach to think about. T is for true. Is the disagreement based on core biblical truths? Or is it more a case of just viewing things differently? H is for helpful. Is focusing on the disagreement actually helpful? What effect is it having on me and my relationship with the other person or with God? I is for important. How important actually is it? Is it more important 
than my family relationship or my church relationship with the other person. N is for now. Is it something I have to take action on now? Do I have to go and confront that person now? Or can I give God time and space to work on me and to work on the other person? And K is for kind. How could I show kindness to that other person even in the midst of our disagreement? So if you think you disagree with somebody, think. In in his teaching, John Wesley suggested some other practical ways that we can show love to someone that we disagree with or that we differ from. Number one, try treating them as a companion. Why don't I invite them over for a coffee or lunch? Two, don't think or speak evil of them, but focus on what you have in common and decide to think well of them. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Three, pray for them. Four, encourage them to do good. Ask them about what ministry they're involved in and see if you can give them a word of encouragement. And five, collaborate them with them in ministry. I think you'll find that there's a lot of common grounds that we get with people when we work alongside each other. You know, when we work in teams or that kind of thing, it really breaks down those, those barriers, doesn't it? Have a go. Try that. And I'd love to know how you get on. Paul tells the Colossians to clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Paul understands that as members of a diverse community we're going to need certain qualities and actions in order to remain unified and he tells us to clothe ourselves in them, put them on. That's a deliberate action, isn't it? Compassion. Kindness, gentleness, patience, forbearance, forgiveness, love, peace, and gratitude. Interesting how much overlap there is there with what Paul describes as the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? What we need to build a good and beautiful community that is unified is what God grows in us through his Holy Spirit dwelling in us. The more connected we are to that generous God, the more filled we are with his Spirit the more we will see these fruits in our lives and the more we will see our relationships and community transformed into the one that God wants to build. But I think you might agree the key action that we need to exercise if we are in relationship with each other is forgiveness. Anyone who's ever been part of a family knows how important forgiveness is on a daily basis. (laughs) When we exist in close relationships with people, we will often, inadvertently, and sometimes intentionally, hurt each other. (laughs) So if we're able to continue in relationship with people, we have to forgive and be forgiven. Paul advises the Colossians to forgive as the Lord forgave you. It's when we understand how much we have already been forgiven that we can freely forgive others showing them the same mercy that we've already been shown. N.T. Wright says, Paul here makes two points. First, it's utterly inappropriate for one who knows the joy and release of being forgiven to refuse to share that blessing with another. Second, it's highly presumptuous to refuse to forgive one who Christ himself has already forgiven. But don't forget, Our ability to forgive is not just modelled on Christ, but it's also empowered by Christ. Theologian Miroslav Volf says, Christ forgives through us, and that is why we can forgive. We can't actually do it that well in our own strength. It's not an act of willpower, but a supernatural gift that we can partner with God in giving. I'm really conscious of the times that I've caused offence and hurt 
and been forgiven so graciously in this community. And I know it's something really vital for us to cultivate. If you know that for forgiveness is something you're struggling with, or you just want to explore it a bit more, you fi might find Archbishop Desmond Tutu's book, the Book of Forgiven, which he wrote with his daughter, and it comes out of his experience of the reconciliation movement in South Africa. Um, helpful. It's a really practical book with lots of practical exercises to help with that process of forgiveness. So if you're aware that you're holding on to unforgiveness, you might want to take this week to start by praying for the person who has hurt you. Remind yourself of your identity and theirs in Christ as totally forgiven and as a new creation. If you don't feel ready or able to forgive that person straight away, you might want to ask a friend, someone else in the community, to kind of share that burden with you. Ask them to pray for you. Ask them to pray for the other person and see if that doesn't start to make things change. Of course, you might also be aware that you yourself need forgiveness from someone here. And you might want to take the opportunity this week to go and apologise to that person and see if you can start that journey towards reconciliation together. The final point that I want to take from this passage is about what I've called encouragement. Paul says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Part of being in a Christian community means being willing to be involved in the spiritual development of other people in the community and being open to others being involved in yours. Being a Christian is not just about me and my faith and relationship with God. The Bible makes it really clear that this is a corporate thing that we do as a family of believers. Paul suggests that it involves teaching and admonishing, which means like warning or advising each other in wisdom, worshipping as a family and giving thanks together. James Bryan Smith highlights the false narrative that we may have picked up about church, which is that it is a community here to serve my needs. There's a really real danger of becoming consumer Christians who church shop around till we find the one that we like, the one where we like the worship music, or the service just fits in with our schedule, or we can blend into the crowd and listen to the talk and drink the coffee and then head home feeling blessed. But the true narrative is that church is the community which we allow to shape our lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, the Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. He needs him again and again when he's uncertain and discouraged. That's what our church community should look like, to remind us of who we are in Christ, of what we're aiming to become, and also not be afraid to challenge us or hold us accountable. I'm so grateful for Christians who've spoken into my life to call out and help nurture the gifting that they see in me, to bring me a word of encouragement or comfort when I most needed it, who've been faithful in prayer for me and for my family, and who've even been courageous enough to challenge me when I have been on the wrong path. There are too many examples to give here, but I could mention a few. The hours of teaching and training that Neil and Elinid have poured into my life as they've helped me to grow in leadership, the many, many times that my prayer triplet have prayed for me and with me in moments of need. And twice, really clearly I remember, important warnings that I received from Christian friends early on in my walk with Christ, which helped me avoid making serious mistakes. We need each other, don't we? So who could you encourage this week? Is there someone that you know in our community who's struggling, who needs a word of encouragement to lift them up, to remind them that they're loved and valued? Who could you invest your time in this week by suggesting that you worship together or read the Bible together or pray together? 
Or perhaps you know you need to be accountable to someone if you're struggling, maybe with a particular sin or fear. Someone who will ask you, how are you? And commit to praying for you. Let's commit to being a community who encourage each other. If you're just visiting today, I hope you still found this helpful as you decide if this is a community that you'd like to be part of and we'd love to get to know you more and help you get connected. Or maybe you wouldn't even call yourself a Christian, but you'd like to be part of a community like that. Then you're so welcome to come and explore faith with us as you get to know us and the loving God that we serve. I'd love to talk to you afterwards if that's you. So here's just a reminder of some of the soul training suggestions that I've made for this week, focusing on those three things, unity, forgiveness, and encouragement. You might just want to pick one that really resonates with you today and give it a try this week.
Thank you for watching. We hope you've found this online service helpful and encouraging. If you'd like to find out more about Melton Vineyard or get in touch with us, our website is meltonvineyard.org.uk. And of course, you can find us every Sunday morning at 10.30am at John Fernley College on Sculford Road. If you're able to make it to one of those on-site services, we would love to meet you. In the meantime, God bless.